how AI is going to make the next version of democracy slash kind of replace democracy entirely uh, in a very weird uh, way. If you're new to my channel, basically this is a long, long paper I've written. It's like 15 pages, single space in a Word doc. Uh, I'm going to just be reading through it and probably ranting on top of that, so long video. Um, but we're getting into political science today, which I don't know very much about, so this is kind of out of my league, but whatever. And then um, the actual specific implementation of AI, of just right now existing ChatGPT bots, basically. All right, so let's get to it. The fundamental question of governance. Oh, I didn't think about that with this. Oh, no. Well, here we go. Sure. Fundamental question of governance of large groups throughout history. I should say history there. Sorry, this is literally the first draft that I wrote. I haven't even edited it at all. Is how to make decisions efficiently and in a manner that is long-term stable. First, we had small familial tribes that likely came to some sort of consensus or had a loose matriarchal hierarchy for decision making. Um, and yes, it was matriarchal in most cases, which is super interesting compared to today. As bands grew in size, we developed chiefs as official leaders, often matriarchal as a layover from the previous system, or alpha male based in societies with more need for intergroup violence. With the development of city-states, we invented monarchs, people with full authoritarian right to command, which was usually passed down in a patriarchal manner through or through religious theocracy. Direct democracy is version one of democracy and was developed for sake of increasing decision-making quality in order to prevent the chaos of people rising up to overthrow unfair rulers. At least that's the implicit reason why it was implied. Um, you would assume that the... I haven't looked at the history actually, um, but I would assume that at some point Athens had... Uh, regular authoritarian rule and that that was overthrown and replaced with a democracy for that reason um, effectively even if they didn't know it at the time but they were just advocating for themselves obviously it also existed as the far end of a spectrum that had monarchy on the one side and oligarchy in the middle monarchy was only tenable for as long as one person can maintain power but power is highly likely to fragment with increases in population wealth and or education of course, the first version of direct democracy in Athens was not a true direct democracy and actually somewhere between a democracy and oligarchy because of how only land-owning males could vote. Representative democracy is version 2 of democracy and was developed for efficiency's sake. For bodies larger than a small city-state, direct democracy was not logistically tenable. The idea here is a subgroup of is a subgroup elects a representative, and that representative then goes and engages in direct democracy among other representatives. This essentially exists as a trade-off. We citizens sacrifice some resolution in exchange for decreased time commitments and the ability to govern as a larger coalition. Many European countries make a majority of their decisions through representative democracy and then occasionally hold referendums on difficult slash contentious issues, so they fuse direct democracy and representative democracy. Pretty interesting. Not very educated on what they do, actually, but like that's my impression. The choice. All forms of governance exist essentially exist upon the top-down versus bottom-up axis. All other axes that governance structures exist upon can usually be thought of as situational derivations of this fundamental one. Um, I kind of made that up just there. That's my impression. I don't actually know that for a fact. I have not studied poli-sci at all, but this is the way I'm thinking about this. So don't think about all my current discussions in this paper of political science as fact thought of by poli-sci people. Um, think of it more as my impression and the assumptions that I am working off of given my limited knowledge. Um, feel free to critique and tell me how I'm wrong. Top-down governance structures make decisions more quickly. Um, so like only one person or fewer people have to come to an opinion for a decision to be made. And they're capable of carrying out simpler decisions over larger coalitions thanks to disregard for resolution, disregard for what for the diversity of viewpoints and wants and needs of that large coalition. Therefore, making them extremely efficient in terms of the percent of, hum of available human labor needed to devote towards governance, but are also more prone to corruption, less representative of the people, thereby increasing the odds of proletariat dissatisfaction and putting them at risk of violent uprising. In order to quell dissent, top-down governance structures are incentivized to minimize information transfer to and between citizens, thereby making them even less representative of the people. Propaganda and other group mind control tactics, uh, tactics such as those which are obviously displayed by North Korea or even low-key by, by the U.S. are therefore only effective in the short to medium term, as they exacerbate the core problem of top-down governance structures in the long run. 
It's hard to maintain that artificial that artificial satisfaction since your propaganda slash silencing system can never be perfect. Given enough time, information will creep in, dissent will appear, and people will revolt. Um, these blue notes are usually just tangents, not part of the main paper, but they're sometimes necessary, sometimes skippable. If I skip one, pause and read it if you want to. I'm going to read this one though. For those who are confused at this point, wondering how representative democracy could be included in this section and what the heck U.S. propaganda is, I'm sorry, there's no time to red pill you right now. Um, if you disagree with me on all this stuff, you can keep reading this or listening to this video, reading this paper, um, and it won't ruin your reading of the actual core concepts here. But I did use that U.S. example, wanted to like, clear up the confusion right here. Um, U.S. is a good example of that, like North Korea is, just less or so, obviously a lot less or so. But trust me, the U.S. is controlled entirely by big corporations. Your vote has zero effect on actual policies that get implemented, whereas the uh, opinion of the top 1.1%, whatever the heck does. This top-down system disguising itself as bottom-up should be familiar when you think about how Russia, China, and North Korea all insist that they are democracies or republics. It's literally in the names. The People's Republic of China and the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. Um, except the U.S. actually at one time was a bottom-up system, sort of, kind of. I mean, sort of, kind of. More so than it is today. What the heck? Today, high school students in Germany not only learn about World War II propaganda from in their own country, but also about modern-day U.S. propaganda as part of their curriculum. Like, it's, it's a thing. It's an issue. While top-down governance structures are, at first glance, extremely efficient in terms of the percent of human labor that needs to be dedicated towards governance, their practice of minimizing information transfer and restriction, de restriction decision-making ability restricting decision-making ability to a select few mean that the human labor used is extremely low quality, thereby ruining this efficiency advantage to, of the approach. The citizens in authoritarian governments tend to be undereducated, malnourished, overworked, etc. So even though a smaller, and they are, they are that because of the incentives of the top-down structure, because the um, authoritarian leaders need to keep them that way in order to um, effectively maintain power and prevent dissent etc. So even though a smaller percent of their effort needs to go towards governance, um, they still end up less economically productive than their bottom-up counterparts. So the, I am thinking about um, the trade-off between top down and bottom-up as like, uh, are you going for percent of total labor needed to govern, or are you going for um, quality of the labor you have, basically? Bottom-up governance structures make higher quality decisions by definition of from the viewpoint of their constituents. Like we're defining high quality decisions as like whatever the constituents like, basically. That's how we're operationalizing it. But also thanks to the inherent qualities of Hayekian decentralized information. Therefore, being far more likely to work. We're going to get into decentralized information later, I think. Therefore, being far more likely to work towards increasing standards of living and mitigating, if not completely annihilating, the risk slash incentive for violent revolts. However, they also make decisions extremely slowly and require dedicated mass participation, thereby taking up a large percent of human labor, which could be potentially better utilized elsewhere, and leaving themselves vulnerable to issues that require quick decision making, such as war. In order to satisfy constituents, bottom-up governance structures tend to implement policies that further exacerbate the percent of human labor issue, such as shorter work weeks. Such heavy dedication of human time towards governance and simultaneous limitation of the total available amount of human labor, um, human time, should lead to a society that gets relatively little done outside of governance compared to top-down structures. However, this is at first glance disadvantage is far outweighed by the investments that bottom-up governance structures put into their people, thereby raising the productivity of their available human labor. Even though they dedicate a larger percent of their time towards administration rather than application and limit the total available amount of labor hours, their impressive amount of work done per unit time results in societies that are usually, if not always, far more economically productive, along with other stuff like they're doing knowledge work not manufacturing at a certain point not agriculture and the whole um imperialism thing and taking resources and stuff obviously but we're skipping past a lot of stuff this effect is further bolstered by the political stability by their political stability which encourages long-term trade partnerships and alliances because it's extremely unlikely that they'll undergo sudden violent uprising and replacement of the systems of power other countries can be more sure of the long-term outlook of these potential allies Slow movements of the pendulum along a trend line are far better than for stability than sudden violent releases of pressure. 
fragmentation in the context of governance structures refers to the breakdown or disintegration of a centralized system of control, leading to the emergence of multiple, often competing centers of power within a previously unified political entity. This phenomenon is characterized by a loss of cohesion, communication, and coordination among the various parts of the government or empire. Both bottom-up and top-down governance structures eventually experience issues of fragmentation. A couple historically notable examples that come to mind include the Roman and Mongol empires, which were top-down um, empires, at least the Roman was for periods of time, uh, and the United States and, and, and in general overall, like on average was. And the United States Civil War, which at time which at the time was bottom-up, the transition to top-down did not come about for the most part until um, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. We did still have top-down in the sense of like oligarchy of white landowning males, obviously, um, but the top-downness today, now that corporations are in charge, is much, much more intense. There's, very, there's far fewer people with said influence. Um, fragmentation of governance structure is a function of two things, technology and culture, which are themselves an entangled system. Technology's primary role in preventing fragmentation consists of increasing ease of information transfer, which has been the primary beneficial function of technology since the invention of language and the wheel. It's extremely difficult to maintain control over an empire when you can't communicate with its different parts in an orderly and timely manner. Technology has other effects as well, such as better better weaponry making it easier for top-down systems to keep those with lagging technology under submission. Overall, the effect of improving technology throughout history has been one of preventing fragmentation, thereby allowing for a larger and larger coalition sizes. Hence why we went from uh, once upon a time you were a big empire if you had a few city-states, um, to eventually the Roman Empire, which was the Mediterranean, to now the U.S. Empire, which is in the 90s was just fully worldwide and dominant. Asabia, I never actually heard this word said out loud. I'm going to say Asabia, a concept introduced by the 14th century historian Ibn Khaldun in his work Mukaddima. Again, I haven't heard them written out loud or spoken out loud. Refers to the social cohesion and collective solidarity within a group or society, especially in the context of governance and politics. It's a form of group consciousness that binds individuals together, enabling them to act in a unified manner. The United States could be said to have extremely low Asabia during the Civil War, but each of the two sides had relatively high Asabia, um, and specifically the states had very, in the South especially had very high Asabia. For example, um, Robert E. Lee siding with Virginia specifically, like he was saying, wherever Virginia goes, I will go. Um, the states had very high Asabia, specifically in the South. Hence their ability to band together against the other. This should emphasize the contextual definition of Asabia. It's defined uniquely for each potential cohort at all levels of hierarchy to group identity that exist. So you can talk about the Asabia of the national level, the Asabia of the regions, the Asabia of the states, the Asabia of the counties, the Asabia of the towns. You can talk about how much it's like the, it's, it's nationalism is just national Asabia. Like how much are people identifying with and like ride or die feeling with a given group however you define that group at whatever level size. The odds that a group's governance structure will fragment depends on its level of technology and asabia. Higher levels of technology make it easier to keep the system together by both facilitating information transfer and enabling violent control of constituents. So information transfer is good for both bottom-up and top-down um, uh, type of governance structures, but mostly better for bottom-up. Um, and uh, violent control of constituents, obviously that type is... Um, better for top-down governance structures. Decreasing asabia is the same as increasing will to fragments. For a given technology, for a given level of technology in a group size, there exists a critical level of asabia which the group must stay at or above in order to avoid fragmentation. Hierarchical government governance structures. A key invention in the realm of governance structures was the capacity to define the extent to which said systems are bottom-up versus top-down in a hierarchical manner. Although unlike traditional physical inventions, this mechanism counts as technology. For example, uh, in the United States, we have governance structures all the way from the federal government down to the individual. The federal government, in theory, engages in representative democracy, a primarily bottom-up mechanism that cleverly incorporates some aspects of top-down systems, aka representatives, so that we don't need to engage in direct democracy. 
While not the topic of this essay, in reality, the federal government is a corporate structure in disguise, which is a modern version of oligarchy. Rich people, oligarchs, hold a disproportionate percentage of the shares in companies, and those corporations lobby with billions of dollars to receive trillions worth of benefit, successfully controlling the results of elections and the options available in elections to the point where the median American's opinion has no say in legislative outcomes. Not even results of elections, just the options available in elections, honestly. Um, the state governments exist as microcosms of the federal government with slight variations on rules and different responsibilities. For example, states get to control their own policies on education. And county, city, town, neighborhoods, HOAs, community organizations, right? And the family unit is itself a governance structure. Similar to how state rules can differ, there are... There is lots of variation in the family unit. For simplicity here, we can just mention the traditional single-income nuclear family, which is very outdated by now, obviously, but it's in everyone's head already, which essentially exists as a microcosm of authoritarian communism. The father makes all decisions deemed important, and resources are distributed from the haves, the father, to the have-nots, the mother and children, according to their need. So a mother might need more than children, or maybe opposite, I don't know. We can abstract out the hierarchy a bit and just talk about a given level, L, its supergroup, L plus 1, and its subgroups, L minus 1. Denote the lowest level, L naught, as L naught, and define it as the individual. We will use the terms level and group somewhat interchangeably. However, it should be noted that it would not make sense to refer to L naught as a group. Um, I, I had this whole notation I set up here, and then I really didn't use it the rest of the paper. I really, probably should have, but whatever. Um, if you want to, you can convert it all in your head to that notation. I, I kind of like the notation a lot. Um, it needs a better version of the notation. Like, instead of plus one and minus one, you need something else there, but it's cool. The two key questions, like I, I, I could see myself doing some kind of game theory-ass math like proofs based off of this level idea. The two key questions of hierarchical governance structures are, one, should a given level L be bottom-up or top-down? Two, what rights and responsibilities should a given level L have domain over? The very innovation of hierarchical governance structures is that we can tune one and two, meaning that the overall system need not be entirely bottom-up or top-down, and rights slash responsibilities can be distributed according to where they best function, which usually corresponds with levels where a sibia peaks. Uh, what those groups care about, and whether groups at that level agree or disagree with each other. Selection of levels of governance. There are an infinite choice of levels to create governance structures upon. Do the kids in the family unit get to band together and represent themselves to the parents as a cohesive whole, or should they talk to them individually? Similar thing with unions to companies, right? Should, you, should your street have its own micro-local governments? What about your neighborhood? Side of town? Should states band together into regions and create regional governments that fit in between state and federal? How and which countries should band together and create international coalitions such as the UN, NATO, European Union, etc.? Should all international coalitions and independent countries answer to a single worldwide coalition? These are questions that like you can ask a question like that at every possible group size, basically. Um, it's not it's not actually people take it as like take it for granted the sizes we currently have that we act upon right now and have governance structures on right now but really um it's there's infinite number of ways to choose which levels to use so how do you do so the way that actual levels of governance get selected is it, we're going to ignore all the complicated and historical events and everything essentially a result of asabia all possible levels have asabia whether that be a large amount or absolutely none Levels with high acebia tend to build governance structures around themselves whenever possible because their acebia is the very thing that allows them to advocate for themselves and the creation of a structure. Whenever possible, as in like sometimes it's not possible, for example, the um, it's called the Kurds? K, is that the right letter on that? They're in Turkey and Syria and stuff. Like they have no option to build a structure right now. Um, but whenever possible, um, the groups people identify with eff effectively will choose to self-govern if possible. It's hard to imagine two separate groups of people who, with no shared asabia, willingly and spontaneously deciding to band together and create a governance structure that encompasses them both. Um, when it does happen, it's not spontaneous. Um, in our world, it's usually uh, the West drawing arbitrary border lines in Africa is what I'm referring to. Um, while Asabia changes over time, existing governance structures generally have a will to self-preservation, hence why countries have civil wars and revolutions rather than immediately and peacefully ceding to counter-movements. 
Modern democratic governance structures do allow for changes in public sent- sentiment on certain issues over time, but they are not built to account for changes in Asabia. Rather, modern democracies have traditionally attempted to avoid this issue by encouraging Asabia at the level they exist upon. This has worked for the most part, but options like those exercised in Brexit and offered in the Scottish independence referendum are not always available. See Northern Ireland, right? Uh, and open up the question of how we might go about creating a system that is more dynamic and reflective of Asabia. Um, it's it's odd that the UK does so much of that, actually, with the um, independence referendums and the um, Brexit and everything. That's so funny that my both examples were from the UK. Certainly, the United States is not currently enter- entertaining a Texas or a California independence referendum. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't even care about that. We would not um, entertain the idea at all. Implicit in this suggestion is the assumption that there is some benefit to, the, to governance structures corresponding to group asabia. This should not be difficult to see, given how difficult it becomes to govern and get anything done in polarized countries such as modern-day America. However, also of note is the benefit of some level of inertia where governance structures lag behind changes in Asabia. For example, the South being forced to remain part of the Union after the American Civil War was certainly in the best interest of both groups, not to mention the former slaves, obviously, despite the low Asabia of the country at the time. Um, alternatively, you could uh, interpret the Asabi of America as a whole at the time of the American Civil War could be thought of as like not that low, given the fact that many Northerners, such as Lincoln, had their primary motivation as maintaining the Union rather than to end slavery. They cared about the Union more than did slavery. Uh, this opens up an interesting question, not to be discussed here, of not only an individual's group identity, but also their labeling of the group identity of others. It also points to the many gaps in our current analysis that reduces all phenomenon to Asabia. To a large extent, this conflict necessarily implied Northerners forcing their morality and economics on us slaveholding Southerners, which is an issue entirely separate from Asabia. If anything, one might argue that the American Civil War had nothing to do with had nothing at all to do with Asabia. Both Northerners and Southerners wanted to maintenance of the Union, but Southerners wanted to keep slaves in order to maintain their economic and cultural way of life. Uh, does this bolster my point by making the Civil War an exception that our theory need not approach? or create a bleeding hole in my theory as an exception to my rule. Uh, Whatever, um, I'm hoping that uh, exceptions prove the rule. I've heard that phrase before. I don't know. Sorry, side tangent. Uh, Should a given level be bottom-up or top-down? An obvious question, but one that becomes complicated and hard to reverse. In large families, you certainly wouldn't want to implement direct democracy with kids outnumbering their parents and voting in ice cream for dinner every night. Conversely, a ruler of the world would be extremely unlikely to please the majority, an authoritarian ruler. Entangled in this question is the next, that of which rights and responsibilities the level in question has. Going with the previous family example, bottom-up rule in the family might not be ideal for ensuring that everyone eats their vegetables, but it's a great way to ensure that the weekend is spent on an activity which everyone will enjoy. Conversely, the issue of climate change requires a coordinated approach by all people across the globe, and this may only be possible through a top-down global leadership. As it stands, whether a given level engages in bottom-up or top-down organization largely depends on history, as systems are difficult to change once in place. In theory, the choice should depend on the diversity of viewpoints within the group, and thus the likelihood of disagreement. Groups with homogenous views can function more efficiently under the top down rule and not waste time on bottom-up practices like voting so long as members are unlikely to disagree with each other. For example, corporations tend to function relatively efficiently under top-down rule by CEO because everyone's incentives align, increasing profit, which is then hopefully reflected on their wages, right? It should be, however, noted that there exists a correlation between a group having high asabia and having homogenous views. A group with heterogeneous views is at a certain point not a group, but many separate groups, insofar as a group is defined by the similarities between its constituents. Here, it makes it may make sense to assume that groups at lower levels are more, are more likely to be homogenous, and groups at higher levels tend to be heterogeneous. To the extent this is true, we can assume that lower levels function more efficiently under top-down governance structures, while high levels perform levels prefer bottom-up. What rights responsibilities should go to each level? 
The rights responsibilities entailed to each level has been a forefront question throughout political history. You wouldn't want the president deciding what you eat for dinner, just as you wouldn't want your local county government to be responsible for its own military. Assignment of rights and responsibilities has historically been done through trial and error, or vibes, but we can uh, tease out an important guiding principle that leads to successful choices. For any level L and all of the subgroups in L-1, record a measure P of their beliefs slash preferences on a given subject. So some metric, like a, basically have them vote. What's the percent who, who are pro or anti legalizing weed, right? If the preferences of all the subgroups are homogenous, meaning highly similar, then that topic should be the responsibility of level L. If the preferences of all the subgroups are heterogeneous, meaning highly dissimilar, then decision-making abilities for that topic should be left to each individual subgroup. This simple heuristic essentially amounts to saying that if people disagree, let them make their own decisions, but if they agree, then centralize authority and execution abilities in order to see the corresponding efficiency gains in your governance structure. However, it's not usually that easy. Frequently, even though subgroups are disagree, there is an actual correct answer that should be implemented at a level L. For example, see the United States Civil War. How might we go about addressing this issue? Many domains are qualitative or moral, meaning that some methods, method of persuasion, whether that be peaceful or forceful, will be necessary in order to conclude the debate. However, many, many domains in the modern day have quantitative measures of success, and we can use these to our advantage in crafting a dynamic system. Um, this, this whole suggestion, this section right here, is not an AI suggestion. It's more of like a policy suggestion, um, but it would I, I talk about it here. Um, I don't know if it's been invented already, if it's my idea, if it's not my idea, I'm not sure. But I talk about it here because it would do very well integrated with the later AI idea that will come eventually later in the video, right? Introduce a success metric S and trial period length T, um, which all subgroups must agree to in the beginning of the process. So success metric, for example, maybe it's test scores if we're talking about education, right? Um, trial period length, maybe we choose 10 years. I don't know. Uh, yes, this does introduce its own difficulties. Scenario one, if group preferences P are highly homogenous, then designate this topic to the responsibility of level L. Scenario two, if preferences are highly heterogeneous, if, if you don't like the whole notation, this math stuff right now, it's not like math math, but it's like a, a just notation basically to talk about this stuff. Skip past the section, I guess, if you don't, if it doesn't like make much sense to you, um, talking in letters. Scenario two, if preferences are highly heterogeneous, then allow each subgroup L minus one to self-determine its own solution to the problem. After length of time T, check to see how S is doing. Scenario one, level L is given responsibility. Scenario 1A, if level L's solution is successful according to S, then maintain course. Scenario 1B, if level L's solution is not successful according to S, then send this responsibility down to subgroups L-1. Scenario 2, subgroups at level L-1 were given responsibility. Scenario 2A, if level L-1's variety of personalized solutions are all simultaneously, success are all simultaneously successful according to S, then maintain course. And this, this scenario reflects the possibility of meaningful differences between subgroups requiring different approaches. Scenario 2b, if one of the many personalized solutions attempted by subgroups L-1 has resulted in success, according to S, but most have failed, then send this issue to level, up to level L and instantiate the single successful solution. Scenario 2C, if a couple of the many personalized solutions resulted in success but others have failed, then force the subgroups who have failed to choose from among the successful, from among the successful solutions. Scenario 2D, if none of the many personalized solutions resulted in success, then do one of the two following. Choosing between these two options will come down to whether people think there's an, there's an obvious intrinsic benefit to banding together in order to solve this issue. For example, states would likely choose to push the burden of running a military up to the national level for obvious efficiency and coordination reasons. This essentially amounts to a choice of whether we want to keep experimenting to find the correct solution, or if we think that this topic has intrinsic efficiency and coordination benefits when exercised at a larger coalition sizes. Scenario 2DI, randomly select half of the subgroups to continue on and the other half to attempt brand new strategies. The continue on ones, we're assuming maybe we just need more time for the solution to like work itself out and to actually put into effect. Whereas um, uh, the half that's do brand new strategies, we're still experimenting basically. 
scenario 2DII. Send the responsibility for this issue up to level L. I hope you get the point here and can see how this process would continue for further steps of time, roughly, right? Of note is the fact that supergroups L plus 1 exist above level L. A more thorough analysis would properly define this decision-making system recur recursively. Market systems and decentralized information. Along to hierarchical systems, the other key invention that has allowed for a more bottom up approach to governance is money. Yes, we are extending the definition of governance to all organization decision making systems. The idea here is that prices act to efficiently convey information that would otherwise be impossible to organize in a barter system and facilitate transactions too complicated for the kinship and recipro reciprocity based altruism of hunter gatherer style socialism. High prices indicate high scarcity and supply difficulties relative high prices indicate high scarcity and supply difficulties relative to, to demand, while low prices indicate the opposite, and these numbers are determined automatically, dynamically, and instantaneously in a manner that naturally emerges from human behavior. <clears throat> Another side note, <clears throat> please do not confuse praise of the information efficiency of free market systems with praise of capitalism. Contrary to popular belief, the freedom, of the freedom of a market is orthogonal to whether capital is owned by individual people or shared between the masses. Furthermore, free markets are only useful insofar as they create information efficiencies that help reach human goals, but any introductory economics class will teach about the many about many of the different types of market failures, many of which result from asymmetric information. Just wanted to clarify that. So don't think I'm being pro-capitalism or socialism here. <clears throat> this mechanism was fleetingly grasped at with Adam Smith's coinage of the term invisible hand of the market, but not developed rigorously until Hayek described decentralized information. The idea of the... The idea of the latter is that some uh, is that some knowledge exists in a manner that is not capturable by summaries or statistics, and thus cannot be taken into account by top-down organization systems. Thus, explaining the excessive historical inefficiency of those systems, even when run by experts. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting kind of messed up throat right now, and it's gonna slow this video down quite a bit, I think. For example, despite the best efforts, data gathering, and system modeling of Soviet scientists, they were never going to be able to incorporate granular knowledge such as the production capabilities of a specific factory on a given day, given the fact that one worker called out sick and a couple machines were out for maintenance. This led to arbitrary quotas that were never met and usually lied about, whereas in a market system that factory that factory's products would just be at lower supply in their town that day and thus demand a higher price, thereby effectively communicating the production situation to relevant consumers in the most information-dense and simplified manner possible. Since its invention, societies have faced the choice of whether to delegate a responsibility to the free market, a government-restricted market, or make it an entirely government-owned and run enterprise. Here we will not get into the specifics of how said choices are made, nor the plethora of cases where they are made incorrectly in issues with a profit incentive. Instead, let's just keep in mind the importance of the cumulative effect of decentralized information when making many, many small decisions that add up to create the macro system. So if you make a good system that actually works, you need to incorporate that. The idea, what is swarm intelligence? Swarms refer to the phenomenon in nature where a large number of organisms exhibit complicated and coordinated behavior using entirely bottom-up communication mechanisms. The most salient example is that of a school of fish, which changes and maintains direction and speed in unison despite no single fish being the decision maker or communicator and all of them having teensy tiny brains. Swarms exhibit what is referred to as swarm intelligence, meaning the unit as a whole exhibits intelligent behavior capable of of reacting properly to the environments that any individual in the swarm could not possibly know to perform on their own, such as steering away from a shark that's too far away slash out of the field of view for most of the fish to even notice. Only very few fish have to notice the shark for the entire group to react well to that shark. 
what is conversational swarm intelligence, CSI? I first saw it in this paper um, that uh, that I will leave the paper link in description as well as a prior video going in depth in the paper. It's a pretty short one, but whatever. The idea here is that standard chat rooms and internet communication platforms like Twitter are poor tools for organizing and encouraging engagement in large groups, often descending into a couple very loud mouths overpowering the conversation and discouraging engagement. Here you have a big chat room, just like 100 people or something. Conversational swarms break the collective down into smaller subgroups, so hence these little tiny groups right here. Encourage communication within each subgroup. So within your little group, you are now having a conversation that's much easier, smaller, simpler, more like a, like having breakout rooms if you're a university student in like a Zoom classroom or um, just like a, like a group chat. You're just in a group chat, basically. It's easier to talk in a group chat effectively and have nuanced opinions and discussions than it is to do so on Twitter. Then... We use a large language model to periodically summarize each conversation and send the summaries to one or more neighboring groups. So that's these yellow lines here. Your group, after a week or something, your let's say your friends talking about politics, your, your conversation gets like the key points are summarized by ChatGPT. That summary is then sent to this group and to this group, basically. Because groups are now small and intimate, everyone is more encouraged to participate. The shared summaries act to facilitate information propagation throughout the whole cohort supergroup. In the above diagram, a given group's summary gets sent to two neighboring groups, aka the yellow lines, with 100 people in 14 groups at roughly 7 people per conversation and two summaries sent per group at every time period, let's say every, every day, I don't know. This means it takes seven time periods, seven days, for information from one group to have been given the chance to propagate to every single group. So if you and your group have a good idea, within seven days, everyone will have heard it, assuming that everyone else thinks, thinks it's also a good idea. Because whenever your idea goes into your summary, and then the other groups read your summary and discuss your summary, if they think your idea is good, they will talk about it. And then in their conversation, when it, they get summarized, um, that idea will then get sent to the next groups. Um, benefits to this system. First, as previously mentioned, people are more incentivized to actively engage in small groups than they are in large ones. Like Hence why we have um, schools, like prep schools, advertising their student-teacher ratio kind of thing. Thus, hopefully meaning that we will be able to gather more information in total that is more aligned with the intentions of all group members. So this should be, because of decentralized information, this should be a better metric of the total coalition's uh, preferences than Twitter would be. Second is the idea slash opinion filtration system. Whereas standard large chat rooms have the implicit filter of whoever is loudest slash most persistent, in our new setup, the first filter is the language model summary. We can use prompt engineering to ensure high quality and representative summaries, but the ver by the very nature of summarizing, we will be cutting out unnecessary fluff, thus saving time for the group reading it rather than having to pour through an entire conversation. Second is the fact that a given idea slash opinion which is received in a summary will only be propagated to the next group if its current holding group chooses to further discuss it. Ideas slash opinions that are not discussed will fail to propagate throughout the entire cohort. LLMs, while not unbiased, are significantly less biased than individual people. They are, in fact, the average of all the people they have been trained on, aka the entire internet, so everyone. Go ask ChatGPT to give you a thorough, unbiased breakdown of a contentious issue, and I bet you'll come away from the conversation thinking that it's far more nuanced and reasonable than the Fox and CNN news anchors we currently use to give us our information. LLMs are cheap and quick compared to human labor. A summary of a 100-message conversation by an LLM costs a fraction of a cent, or a, maybe a few cents or a cent or something, and takes a couple seconds whereas the equivalent human labor would entail half an hour or more and whatever the going wage is for knowledge work. LLMs are personalizable. To the extent that bias is desirable, it can be nurtured using RLHF. Whether through prompting or fine-tuning, the system can be catered at the subgroup level to meet the needs of its users. Maybe your group wants its summary to exclude vulgar language or discussions of issues that you all happen to not be interested in. You can cater your system to that. 
I hope you'll agree that conversational storm intelligence on its own is likely already sufficient for certain use cases, such as facilitating an enthralling book club between a large number of readers or even replacing the information propagation part of middle management roles at a small company. While CSI is intriguing, there are a couple of issues. Time for information to propagate. While the size of the overall... Uh, now, this issue, it's still way better than like using middle management in a small company. It's still way faster, but it is still not as, fa as like instantaneous as it could be, right? While the size of the overarching coalition could reach a total of 8 billion people, population of the world, the individual conversation group sizes can't scale past 7, 9, maybe 12 people before the key advantage of a small group discourse start to break down. If we split 8 billion people across 8-person conversations, that's 1 billion conversations. If each sends out two summaries per time period, it'd take an absurdly long time for a good idea to propagate towards where it needs to go, and especially to propagate to everyone. This means CSI doesn't effectively scale past coalitions of a couple hundred if you've got any reasonable level of time constraint. Summaries, so like time constraint isn't like like a need to get decisions out quickly if you need to have a decision made, like everyone to like have discussed and like the discussion to be over. Summaries, and especially catered summaries, are great, but how does this extend to the issues of traditional governance, like enforcing laws, tallying votes, performing boots on the ground labor, and commanding employees? Um, there were more I thought of at some point, but I forgot when I was writing this. I still forget them, whatever. But we want to now fix those issues of CSI. So I've invented Meta Conversational Swarm Intelligence, MCSI. Enter me prepending the word meta to every single idea I ever have. It's absurd. I, or, and modular. Um, I can't help myself. Even if it doesn't relate to those things, I keep using those words. The three core ideas here are hierarchical summarization to fix the speed of propagation problem, personalize the summaries, the summarizers and give them agency, the actual AI bots give them agency, and interoperability between levels. They're essentially designed to fix the limitations of regular CSI, facilitate gradual worker-controlled automation of jobs and decentralized UBI implementation, and build a UBI's universal basic income, and build a dataset slash foundation for aligned AGI based on a collective consciousness. However, in this video today, we'll only be discussing how the limitations of regular CSI can be fixed, thus allowing for MCSI to replace and or augment pre-existing governance structures. At some point, I'll do a video later on, uh, on these two points, on how we can automate away jobs willingly and um, efficiently and gradually, and creates a decentralized UBI system the government's not in charge of, and how we can use this whole thing to build a crazy data set for aligning conscious AGI. Hierarchical summarization. This concept is relatively simple. Let's say we have two cohorts, each of 100 people, and split into 20 groups of five. Not only would each group undergo regular CSI where they send, where they send out and receive two summaries every time period, but the cohorts themselves would also experience meta-summarization. Take all 20 summaries from cohort A and summarize them, and do the same for cohort B. Then send cohort A's meta-summary Where's my keyboard? To be read by cohort B's individual groups and vice versa. Now each group sends out two summaries, two summaries per time period, and receives three. One of which is a meta summary. Let's look at this diagram real quick, right? So I hate how Obsidian's thing makes the sizes change. Um, so this is a very minimal example. So this is like groups of two people. Right, so I'm, I couldn't, I didn't want to do a full like eight people or twenty groups because it's like the diagram would be too crazy and complex. This is as simple as possible, right? Groups of two people get summarized. So that's your group summary, and they have gr two groups in a cohort, right? So cohort A, the two summaries from the two groups. Not only do they get sent into the group, right, um, but they also get the, the summaries themselves get summarized into a Meta summary, right? Cohort A, meta summary. And then that meta summary also gets sent to the groups in the other cohort, right? And so now we can use this and do like meta meta summaries and we can scale to larger and larger sizes and have basically mitigates the CSI's information propagation timeline problem. 
The above diagram is a bare minimum setup of two people per group, two groups per cohort, and two cohorts. The below diagram shows another level up, although the diagrams get progressively uglier. So here we have two meta summary cohorts, right? And then we do a meta cohort, so which makes, I guess, meta meta summaries, right? And those get sent out. It gets ugly very fast, right? But it should work very cool and propagate information in a very interesting way. What this allows us to do is scale to far larger total cohort sizes, since the information now propagates faster. Furthermore, since we can now create summaries of any cohort size, said summaries can be used as a complement or alternative to traditional democracy and decision-making processes. This is, of course, assuming the quality of these language model summaries are good enough to derive specific policy from and properly representative of their constituents, which I think it will be. Personalization and agency this is the next part of the meta idea. What makes conversational swarm summaries especially interesting is that they are not just votes. Assuming the existence of AGI agents based on the same basic structure of current language modeling in the common in the coming years, like months and years, these summaries would be perfect context to ensure that a given group of whatever size is best represented during the actions of independent of an independent AI agent. So I said, assuming the current structure stays the same, right now language models, the way they work, is they're kind of like blank slates in a, in a way. I think you can fine tune them, but whatever. Um, an actual like a foundation model, its behavior is determined by its context. So all of the stuff that it reads before acting, basically. And we want to put our summaries and our meta summaries into its context and say, basically, um, you are an AGI agent with control over the economy or something. Here are the meta, meta, meta summaries of all the human cohorts. Please implement economic policy accordingly, right? This works especially well when you consider the function of this system over time, meaning we constantly have this guiding context updating as the... Con as the constituents discuss the effects of the AI agent's actions. Even further personalization can be achieved through proper prompt engineering, fine tuning, and continual learning of properly personalized models. Interoperability between levels. Especially interesting is the possibility of interaction between agents at different levels, both human and AI. For a simple example, imagine the problem many YouTubers and other influencers have where it is impossible to properly interact with every single one of their fans. Instead of all of my YouTube subscribers, um, instead, all of my YouTube subscribers participate in a conversational swarm of my Discord, and then I speak directly with the meta summary rather than a limited number of individual subscribers. I imagine this being immediately helpful in a live context for streamers. Rather than a chat that moves too quickly to keep track of, um, everyone gets to engage in a much smaller chat, and the streamer can talk with a simpler summary slash filter highlight feed, right? Here's the diagram for this, right? So I think, is this messing that up? Oh, I hate how the sizes change whenever I get back into this. Um, basically, what do we have going on here? So people, right? They can, at individual levels, implement decisions in the real world. They can act in the real world, right? They have decentralized information that gets summarized into these small group summaries. Those small group summaries our local neighborhood info that gets sent back to those people and those small group summaries can be used to for community efforts to also make actions in the real world right those small group summaries are filtered info they're essentially filtered they're essentially decentralized info but filtered right um gets sent to meta group summarizers right these meta groups send their aggregated info down to individuals so people can be educated on the way the actual cohort like is working right and what's happening in the, at, at the large scale they also um can i'm guessing you like you put like an agi and you let it read meta summaries and you let it like interact with the blockchain they can use internet blockchain robots whatever the agents that we build on top of these uh, meta summaries um can use that stuff to actually act in the world right now they're acting just in the digital world or just in the robot touchable world right but still they can now act in our system right and finally we have outside groups and individuals. This is everyone who is not part of our MCSI framework, right? They send exogenous information to the AGI agents that use our meta group summaries um, directly to them um, whenever they have to interact for some reason, whenever the AGI agent wants to like, implement like a smart contract or something on the blockchain or like just be a robot like talking with somebody with an outside, with an outsider. 
those outsiders are basically conveying exogenous, exogenous information to those metagroup summarizers, right? And those outside groups and individuals are also constantly through interaction sending exogenous, exogenous information, outside information to people, individual people, right? Just when you meet someone and talk to them or work with them who is that person is not part of your MCSI structure, that is what's happening here, right? And those outsiders actually enact exogenous events. They create things happening in the world, right? So that is our structure for the interoperability between hierarchies. But how do we do we decide which agents in the system, whether that be an individual human or an AGI trained on summaries, get to perform what actions? The same way we already do, but maybe maybe a bit more complicated, right? As a society, we can still use free market systems, governing bodies, constitutions, laws, etc. MCSI is not a complete replacement, at least not in the short to medium term. Excuse me but rather a complementary structure that can be gradually implemented when and where desirable and integrated with pre-existing market systems, governing bodies, laws, um, company structures, uh, social uh, agreements kind of thing, parts of culture. For example, we may find that the jobs of middle management can be largely replaced with meta-conversational swarms, in which case the free market will likely do so in order to save on costs and gain the communication speed increase advantage. Communities such as neighborhoods or clubs may decide to use MCSI rather than or alongside a traditional HOA or corporation structure in order to better ensure that the actions of the organization reflect the wants and needs of its members. A social media and chat room platform may emerge and do a better job in the current public square, like Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, whatever. When interacting with actors outside of NMCSI, of course, use regular money to exchange goods and services and interact use it under the guidelines of regular laws kind of thing, right? When interacting with other actors within your own MCSI, it probably still makes sense to use money to exchange, but maybe... Just maybe, if your goals are aligned, sometimes it will make more sense to just provide and ask for goods and services whenever your meta summarizer bot tells you to do so. Um, this is already a thing in companies, right? You do not pay or um, or charge your coworkers for their labor. Um, your boss, aka like the meta summarizer bot in this in this scenario, your boss tells you both to send each other powerpoints. That's that's how that works, right? Same thing here. In certain scenarios, that can be useful. How should your... So this is a blockchain point. So if, if you don't know what blockchain is, just skip me talking about this um, bullet point right here. Um, how should your DAO actually come to and then implement decisions? Of course, there are already existing decentralized voting mechanisms and those betting systems to determine which suggestions are worth the time to get voted on. But MCSI is orthogonal to all of these, meaning it can be implemented to varying degrees in tandem, potentially even on the blockchain by recording hashes of conversations and or summaries. Maybe a meta summary LLM bot could participate in writing proposals to be voted on. Maybe the conversation structure could be used to help everyone get their bearing before a vote. Maybe your meta summary bot could actually write smart contracts or intelligently implement actions on pre-existing contracts based on the summaries it's receiving. That'd be cool. The beautiful thing about MCSI's loose modular structure is that as these emerge, they can combine at will. Why not connect your community's MCSI to the social media platform or to a different community's MCSI? Just like hierarchically add them together, right? If we find that companies run entirely by MCSIs outcompete those that don't, then wouldn't it be easy and advantageous to combine every single company that does so? So I imagine companies that like fully switched like MCSI based governance, why would they not just like group together in a, in a further hierarchy cohort group type thing? I cannot understate how important this quality is. Every time I hear people talking about solutions to the meta crisis, which is like the, the combination issues of like capitalism and uh, growth based economics and climate change and uh, and nukes, it's like the meta crisis, right? When I hear people talking about the meta crisis, they always come, um, when they always make solutions that are in the form, um, wait, they always come in the form of solutions that are not in everyone's best interest. At the, at the individual level and it must be implemented willingly. One sec.
<sighs> MCSI, on the other hand, is, at least hopefully in theory, in your own best interest to integrate into your own life and workflow and pre-existing governance structures. I call this quality self-propagation, and it's the key quality that allowed money to take over the world. In a given society that has no form of currency, all they need is exposure to another society that does. Even though you and your people may not value these pieces of paper or metal or seashells or whatever, the people across the river do. And you know you can give those people across the river pieces of paper in exchange for things you do care about, like food or water or something. Therefore, the paper, even though it's valueless to you, gains value to you automatically. It is because of this, like just by extension of they value it and you can exchange it with them for things you value. Therefore, you, it gains value to you in so far it, is, it, can, it can get you things you do value. It is because of this quality that once invented, the spread of money around the world was inevitable. I've not fully worked it out yet, but I think MCSI is the same. I think it is at the individual's best interest to join all the MCSIs to implement it in their own structure and life and workflow and, co and company and whatever and governments. Um, I think it will be a self-propagating system and it will not need some like international treaty coalition to enact it and fix climate change. It, this, thing, this thing will on its own enact itself. How does MCSI answer the questions of governance? These, oh, and that whole point right there is key for avoiding corruption. Is I think it will enact itself, and it will be probably to the. I think my into intu my intuition is that it will be to the detriments of people in power, of uh, corrupt capitalist politician, whatever you want to, or authoritarian leaders, whatever you talk about, I think they will not be able to stop it. It will be like an oncoming tsunami that they just can't do anything about. They have no way to avoid it because it's not like a product they can just ban from their country. Like it's a, it's an idea. People can just implement it on their own. Um, and AI will be the whole like conversational swarm thing. The like summaries will be just so widely available and so like impossible to like block from the internet and like we'll have local models that work on your phone you just won't be able to stop it you'll have to take away all computers to stop it basically how does mc and even if you can take away computers you could probably like still have people in your underground rebellion organization act as summarizers how does mcsi answer the questions of governance these details are not fully worked out as this system is a work in progress, but I'm hoping you share my intuition that MCSI is a promising route. Below are my current thoughts on how each core problem of governance might be affected and comparisons to each pre-existing governance system. So the comparisons, first off, tribes, right? MCSI is the only system to share this same intimate group size phenomenon. We really don't know enough about tribal cultures to say much here, or at least I don't. But I have a feeling this is the social dynamic that human mind is built to function within. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because of that, I think if properly channeled, we may end up with humans showing their best side in these little tribal small groups. I am concerned about the, about the tribal tendencies in the, in the negative sense as well, but I don't think they're as big of an issue in this context. Rather than being cut off from other tribes and having us and having an us versus them survival incentives, MCSI encourages productive information transfer between tribes. And honestly, I'm hoping for AI to bring about resource surplus to an extent that um, kind of asymptotically approaches a kind of mild utopia. Monarchy. If implemented, as I imagine, with AGI agents executing a large portion of tasks in the world based off those summaries they're reading then those agents would effectively have the same decision-making speed of a monarch, but with the decision quality of representative democracy, at least in cases where there's already enough info to judge the public's opinion on a matter. Even if we just use summaries to inform a human in that position, I imagine those summaries might be more useful than polling. Although, of course, in certain contexts, such as government executing polls alongside... Although, of course, in certain contexts, such as government... Executing polls alongside MCSI may be helpful, in which case we're back to our worst case scenario with a direct representative democracy. Direct democracy. There's a reason Socrates was not a fan of democracy. Rule by 51% rule by is scary because the majority oftentimes is not so nice to the minority. 
The interesting thing about MCSI is how absurdly good language models are at giving, nu at giving nuanced takes. I'd like to think that an AGI agent acting based off MCSI summar summaries for its context would do a pretty good job of coming to a solution that the most people would find acceptable. Of course, similar things can be said for systems like ranked choice voting, but luckily MCSI is orthogonal to voting, meaning they could be executed together. For example, imagine a scenario where instead of pandering to their base, candidates analyze the MCSI summaries before choosing their stances, and then we do ranked choice voting. I just want to preface this here, right? Like, I'm suggesting this thing, this thing does not have to be implemented the exact way I'm talking about. Like, there's so many ways to think about how to implement this thing in your actual, in your, in your current pre-existing system like it, maybe there's no ai agents and it's just like acting and it's just summaries and politicians use those summaries to inform themselves like there's so many ways to like think about this and to test out how it could be used representative democracy if there's any system that mcsi is most similar to it's easily this one one could phrase it as just the natural extension of representative democracy in a world where humans are no longer the only intelligent actors aka ai However, unlike representatives, it is likely the case that LLM-based agents that act based off these summaries in their context would be far less susceptible to corruption. Furthermore, especially if they're just blank language models, like, come on. Furthermore, MCSI summary bots don't need to eat, sleep, or take vacations, and will likely have other added efficiency advantages, like being able to think crazy fast and in parallel. Core problems of governance. Oh, and they don't get old. They don't become a group of, of rule by 80-year-old boomers. Come on. So, core problems of governance. How do we address these with MCSI? First up, top-down versus bottom-up. Depending on the implementation, for example, whether you create AGI agents to act upon information gathered in the meta-summaries, MCSI has the potential to incorporate the best qualities of both top-down and bottom-up structures in many scenarios and in different contexts. I won't say much more here because I feel like that was already made clear in the previous section of individual comparisons. But I imagine there's many ways where you could like tune it based off your prompt engineering or like do you give the agents actual action ab abilities and do you put it alongside a legal, legal structure or something? Like there's many ways I bet to tune this to get the best of both worlds potentially and to try different ways of like top down versus bottom up. Asabia slash selection of levels of governance. Of particular interest with MCSI is the fact that in theory, people are choosing their groups for conversation as well as what cohorts their group's conversations should be participating in. This means that MCSI allows for natural structuring according to Asabia levels at the moment. However, as mentioned in the beginning, we don't necessarily want instantaneous changes in any governance system. Some level of inertia where the structure lags behind changes in Asabia may be desirable to prevent instability or temporary for temporary or fleeting Asabia changes. This could be worked out. I think this can be worked around by simply adding on rules to whatever systems we implement this in. Like if we're doing like a blockchain based AI structure, like M MCSI um, rules for how often you change cohorts or something, maybe so just a limit to how many conversations, how many conversation groups and or a meta summary cohorts can be a part of. And that's like, yeah. Furthermore, it may be the case that a bit of inertia is built into the system under certain circumstances. For example, in cases where AGI agents use meta summaries to guide their behavior, if everyone messes around with what groups they're participating in frequently, then, you, then the meta summaries provided to that AGI would be unstable. Not only that, but if your, if your conversation group jumps into a cohort for a very short period of time, then it's highly unlikely you'll be able to influence that cohort in a notable way. So you're incentivized to stick around. Um, yeah, I think there might be like, like actual, a good amount of built-in um, inertia already there. Fragmentation. Top-down systems go about preventing fragmentation by disincentivizing it, and bottom-up systems go by attempting to r raise Asabia at the level they exist upon. MCSI is built around fragmentation. You could phrase it as encouraging fragmentation, or like being built for it to work, or as fragmentation not really even existing in the first place, because even if you fragment, like you're still in an MCSI. B 
Because MCSI is inherently modular in structure, groups can choose to split off from their meta cohorts if they so choose, and that doesn't result in a breakdown of MCSI. It's still MCSI, you just have different group, cohort, whatever sizes. To be clear, fragmentation is still an issue for any traditional system entangled with an MCSI, even if the idea of MCSI itself does not care. For example, if you choose to run your company using MCSI, then the actual legal structure of your company would likely not deal too well with a large percent of the employees suddenly quitting, as in like separating, fragmenting. Good luck explaining to the governments how to adjust the current legal structure of corporations to account for their behavior of MCSIs. Because of this and the heavy integration with AI, I think over time we'll find an incentive for MCSI-based organizations to use DAOs on the blockchain for organization rather than traditional legal, legal systems whenever possible. If anything, we should all just like get our own legal corporation kind of thing, individual-based, and then like actually use DAOs for organization. What rights and responsibilities should go to each level? I'm not sure what to say here other than the fact that my intuition says that MCSI levels would have a much easier time setting responsibilities up and down to each other than current government structures. The fact that everything functions based on fluid conversation gives me the impression that responsibilities might move like water based on what people prefer. I haven't really thought this through at all though, and this paper is way too long at this point, so I'm going to end it here. If you enjoyed all that, please like, subscribe, hop on the Discord. Um, the original CSI, not, not MCSI, just CSI paper that I read months ago at some point um, is in the description, link below. Um, if you want to discuss this more, again, hop in the Discord, please, YouTube things, like, sub, all that stuff. I will be doing videos later on my claim that this can do a whole, like, um, automate jobs and gradual decentralized UBI and make a data set for conscious AI. I'll have videos on that at some point in the future. Um, but yeah, hope you enjoyed. See ya.